All right. Welcome, everyone, to Nerd of the Rings. We have a very special guest with us today, Mr. Lloyd Owen. You know him as Elendil from the Rings of Power. Lloyd, thank you so much for joining us today. Delighted to be here. I've been a fan of your channel for some time. So, yeah, it's good to be on. Thank you. Yeah, and we've had some some great chances to uh, meet in person and talk Tolkien, and it's been an absolute delight. So I'm really excited for for folks to be able to uh, jump in on on one of our conversations here. Um, the first question that I always like to ask people that I have on as guests is, how were you first introduced to Tolkien? Um, I was given um, I was given the book aged about twelve of the Hobbit and um, from an aunt uh, family yeah close family aunt actually you know one of those aunts that's very much part of the the tight knit group and um, I still remember and I've still got the copy of my bookshelf but that beautiful drawing by Tolkien of Smaug mm. with that beautiful yellow um, bit of colouring in it and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so I just started to read it, and um, there you go, and that was my imagination blown. I'd never read anything like that before, and uh, and it's still <clears throat> it's still very much in my heart that book. Yeah, it's a, it's an extraordinary thing to now be working on on something that 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 same man wrote that um, that really sparked me as a kid. So yeah, um, and I and I read it to my son at, at bedtime when he was 12 years old. So it was kind of a similar sort of age. So it was, um, it was a great, uh, you know, it came round and uh, now it's come round again. So here we are. Lucky yeah. me. Yeah, that's great. I love sharing Tolkien, uh, especially The Hobbit for the younger kiddos that I've got at home. It's a, mm. great, a great thing to share Tolkien with your family. Truly, truly is, yeah. Now I, I, you got to read it out loud, and you think you got to do the voices, and then you forget which voice sounded like what, and then yes. the, kid, the kid remembers and goes, "They didn't sound like that." Dad. <laughs> but there you go. It's like I'm pouring my heart out here. <laughs> I'm putting my I'm putting my heart into this this voice here. <laughs> I'm working my socks off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now I want to dive right into uh, Elendil because we had some, like I said, we had some great conversations you and I uh, both at Comic Con and then in New York, mm -hmm. and Elendil is a character who, you know, con especially considering how important he is, we have very little information on him and even less dialogue from. And when we were at Comic-Con specifically, we spoke about how deep into Tolkien's works you dove to get a feel for this character. Um, so I was curious, what insight into Elendil did you get from uh, the lesser known, you know, deep cut writings like the Lost Road and the Notion Club papers. Yeah, I think it was. I mean, you you do the deep dive and the deep cut because you start and you think there's so much material here. Where where do I start? How do I start finding Elendil? Yeah. Um, where is he in, in all of this literature? And and so obviously, Lord of the Rings, he's mentioned mm -hmm. often. Yeah. Um, and so you you know you get this you get you, you know you have this strong sense. I, I remember from when I read the books myself. You you know he's this hero archetype that you you get very very attached to. Um, but yeah, there's very little read about him. So Notion Club Papers was how I found it first. Yeah, mm -hmm. and reading, um, and re and then reading the different versions DA one and DA three and DA two and, and and all that different stuff. But yeah, the hardest thing was like please. Um, please have written some words for him so yeah. I, can, I can hear him or feel him or something. It's such, it's so limited. Uh, it's essentially the exchange between him and his father. Yeah. Um, Amandil. So, so that is, um, so you sort of cling on to that and then you cling on to that relationship and think, okay, so he, how does he, obviously his father's a hero to him because he, he listens and takes advice, but then expresses something of the, of the, of the, he gets a, he gets an idea that he might lose him on this, mm, yeah. you know. So you, you sense that insecurity in him. Anyway, so that so that was a tiny little opening into it. And then because there is such a limited amount, um, inevitably what then happens is you think, well, I've I've got I've bought all these books. I have you know I have piles of them. Let's get in and let's try and deeply understand the 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 Tolkienian themes that are going to surround this character, even if he's not written specifically about Elendil. There will be in other stories and in other places, there'll be there'll be a similar theme for him, and so um, so that became part of my mission. And then, as the actor, what often happens in adaptation is that you 
you know, you, you do all your research, but inevitably you've got to deal with the script that's in front of you. So what was really helpful about that was was working out what JD and Patrick had left out, what they what was what remained, and what they'd added. Um, and I actually think the the additions here are are really quite brilliant from them, just from an acting perspective as to what you know the, the juice that's firing him um, underneath all that, or his his previous history that's there to to work with. So that's been so trying to find that balance between talking. But the great news about JD and Patrick, as you all know, hopefully if you've read enough about them or listened to them being interviewed, is I mean they 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 understand talking deeply they they were fans before they were writers so um uh so that you know it's all it's safe in their hands in the sense that those themes will be coming through whatever they write for Elendil. I'm, I'm perfectly certain of that now speaking of uh you know your research and the themes of tolkien um what do you think is the most important trait of Elendil that you're looking to come across in this series it's a very good question. I mean, I think heroes are definitely not born, they're made. And that if that is true, which I, I do believe that as a supposition, I think we we have we have to see his fear and then his his courage in the face of adversity. And mm -hmm. um, and I think again, what's very so Kinian is that. And it's rather like um, I've been reading a little bit about Job in the Bible. There's a really quite quite a, quite an intense book by Jung. Yeah. But you know, a lot happens to Job. Yeah. And look at the signpost that Tolkien's left for Elendil. A lot happens to him, and it's about the stamina required, the the ability to turn grief into some sort of wisdom. I think. Mm. Probably. I mean that, and that's that's why I identified Nienna as as probably the god that he might you know he might be close most closely associated with because she sings, she sings of the grief, but it's in, in order that there's some wisdom learned from it. And I think going through this, it will be the effect of that on him, the effect of all of the vicissitudes of life that happen to him that that will shape him. But it's not something he's looking for. It's not something he's looking for. And I think that's that's key. So a steadfastness in him, but. But also a sense that it won't, it will be it will be hard earned, I hope. Yeah, because it is for all of us, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now you mentioned um, <clears throat> you mentioned earlier the uh, conversations in Tolkien's writings about uh, between Elendil and his father, mm -hmm. and in those writings we kind of get a sense of the um, dangerous time that he lives in. In Numenor, as as it's descending, you know, and uh, for the faithful, it's a, it's a perilous time. And in the show, in this last episode, we got a sense that Muriel is kind of feeling out where Elendil's loyalties lie, and it's hinted that you know this is because Muriel is secretly among the faithful, but she obviously doesn't come out and say this. It's kind of you know a little bit revealed in the end when she goes to talk to her father. Um, so how dangerous of a time is it right now for those who would be elf friends in Numenor? Obviously, we don't presently have human sacrifices or anything going on, um, but it still seems like a very volatile time in Numenor. I think that's right. And uh, obviously, you know, in terms of the history of Numenor, Tar Palantir, Miriel's father, is, I mean, he's, he's a slight... Uh, He's an anomaly in that in that most recent line of kings, in the sense that he's tried to return Numenor to the faithful. He's, right. he's in, in exile for it in in prison politically because that that's that's not what the people want or the majority of people seemingly want. And so we discussed a lot because a lot of that is in that scene yeah. with with Midiel and Elendil where she's questioning him. And yeah. it, it really, I thought it was beautifully written. And there was there's there's that balance that you feel Elendil has to strike. Mm -hmm. um, and not not knowing and trying to give an answer that is that is safe honest because again that was this is part of the character of the man is that he he has he has a certain integrity he wouldn't just it doesn't feel like he would just lie he would yeah. try to keep something of the truth in his responses but at the right. same time he has to pragmatically keep himself safe so so i think i think in numenor it's the beginning i 
it's sorry it's not the beginning the begin it's happened already but we, but because we had this brief respite with tar palantir it's all coming back again right and so there, there's a very you know precarious line to tread if you if you have a faithful heart um but i think this is the addition i was talking about with jd and patrick that that um that because of his wife's death and having to bring the children or deciding to bring the kids to the to the capital city of numenor um, there's a there's a kind of slight rejection in him of the elven ways, and I, and 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 what I've identified with that is this, is that in death, because the faithful would believe that that is that is the gift of Iluvatar, therefore there will be some celebration in death, and I don't think he 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 was emotionally at a place to celebrate her death. I think it was too painful, yeah. and therefore there was a kind of ultimately temporary rejection of it. But that's what the move into the city was about, and. Um, and I think pragmatically, therefore, to keep his uh, children safe, uh, he he is a man who's who's keeping his head down, um, and he's a sea captain, and he's trying to he's trying to just do the right thing and and stay on the right side of history. But he doesn't know what the, what the right side of history <laughs> is until perhaps Galadriel arrives, and then all of a sudden, that's the cat amongst the pigeons of his heart. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and speaking of Galadriel, um, <clears throat> I love the line, you know, he said uh, that Elendil says how he has a daughter who runs fast and a son who runs blind, and Galadriel reminds him of both, which I thought that immediately cut to the heart of the big issue with her character, which is the single-minded focus on revenge. And it made me wonder, so is, is Elendil someone Galadriel could learn from when it comes to her flaws? And then on the flip side of that, what do you think Elendil could learn from Galadriel? It's fascinating, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, to a certain extent, if you talk to an elf, they'd say there's nothing to learn. We know it all. If, you, if, you're being <laughs> bit, if you're being a bit mean about the elite, you know, we talked about them as a potential sort of aristocracy. And that's something of what the Numenorians have, has, have chafed against, this idea yeah. of, of them being, um, being in charge of it all. But um, I think... Yeah, I love that line when I read that. Um, there's something about her, and he's witnessed it when he when he brings her to the queen and mm. thinks there's no the, the 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 how headstrong she is, how determined she is that she brooks no argument, mm -hmm. and there is no diplomacy, and there's nothing to play. And I and what's fascinating is is you know to to Elendil, he's learned about her in school in the West, as it were. I mean, he's this legendary figure, and. And so it's about trying to strike that balance between this hero of, of faithful law and history, yeah. who also, when he actually meets her, realizes that there's a there's a youthful inexperience to her or something that's driven that um, she's not making the best choices for herself to, you know, for, for the right outcome. Yeah. Um, and so again, that, that what I liked about what I like about that scene is that is that he spots that as a as a as a as a man and a father and I, and I think that that's also that also makes sense to me of the difference between the two relationships to death to immortality and mm -hmm. and being mortal and I think because um the Numenorians are mortal because man is mortal it forces you to to question things more perhaps than an elf needs to in in certain areas yeah. of life. and I and I and I think that's that's the sort of uh the bridge that we're on in that moment with that scene there's there's a that that despite the fact that i am younger than her by thousands of years there is something that the experience of life in in the full knowledge that i'm going to die has made mm -hmm. given me different a different view and perspective on the world and people and how 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 things happen also you know she she there's been a long time since an elf has been in numenor so she's forgotten right. perhaps how 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 things are done yeah. Now, is there know. so then? Is there anything that Elendil could learn from Galadriel on the flip side of that? I'm sure. I mean, sure, all of it. I mean, I think, I think that perspective of what, um, you know, that there, there, there was a scene that we that did that actually ended up in on the cutting room floor a little bit, and it was some. It was a beginning of a discussion between. Galad uh, between Galadriel and, and Elendil about the nature of you know why Numenor has turned against the elves mm. and you know that that schism that happened between them and, and it's about you know le learning see there's the, the assumption as a Numenorian is that 
well, to be immortal is just wonderful because there's no death. So that's what I want. Right. But but what but what the elf would express is that's that can be eternal grief for those people that you do lose who go to the yeah. halls and end up in the undying lands. You miss them for eternity. Forever. Yeah. That grief just sits and lives with you. So I think all of that stuff can be can be learned uh from her, as well as um you know, she's closer to the source, really, I suppose. Um, I remember when my kids were born, that was a similar thing. I remember that, that there's like a wisdom in their little baby eyes. And I just thought, <laughs> it felt like they're closer to, to the source, you know, that somehow, somehow she, you know, whatever, whatever Iluvatar had in mind, whatever the Valar had in mind, those, those really age old elves have a deep connection to, to the creation. And therefore, I, you know, I feel that, that he could learn what that is about. And that would be a, a rich area of conversation between them, I'm sure. Absolutely. Um, now we did just, uh, just in episode three here, we got our first look at the realm of Numenor and obviously um, it came across seafaring is a very important part of Numenorean, both history and culture. Um, so what was it like preparing to be a sea captain of Numenor? Well, I mean, the whole this whole build up to, you know, this pre-production being in New Zealand was taken up with, you know, three days a week, horse riding lessons, uh, mm -hmm. stunt training, um, sailing lessons. So it was just one of the great gifts. Uh, oh, not to mention, you know, all of us having to go down the gym at least four times a week and try and <laughs> try and look like Numenorians, which is not that easy. <laughs> they are superhuman dudes. Um, so, yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was great to get out on a boat. I mean, I sailed a little bit. I sailed a little bit badly in my life, and so to try and learn that, um, to try and learn it under these circumstances and with Maxim in tow. You know, we just used to try and get a sweepstake as to which one of us would throw up first. <laughs> Him every time. Obviously. Every time, huh? Oh, okay. Um, no, not, not not fair. I'm sure he'll challenge that. <laughs> yeah, it was what was fascinating to me about it was like hanging out with this with the captain, who actually, of course, doesn't get into much unless he really, really needs to. Mm. But trying to have a conversation um, with him as we were as we were doing it, you noticed that he wasn't really hundred percent present on the conversation in the sense that he was he was planning and charting and working out and trying to keep you know that sense for Lendil of leadership. You know, if you if you can if you can take a group of sailors through some some dangerous waters, I think you know you, you don't get to be a sea captain without without understanding your crew. So that was all yeah. you know, a really interesting part of it. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so you mentioned Maxim. Um, in addition to Elendil, we also just met Isildur. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these these two ancestors I've always looked at, you know, um, in Lord of the Rings, we kind of see them, they they kind of embody both the legacy and the burden of Aragorn in Lord of the Rings. Um, so what can we expect to see in this relationship between father and son, father and son, who becomes so central to the world of men in this age? It's interesting, isn't it? Because we've we've discussed a lot, and Maxim and I have d discussed a lot separately to to any creative conversations we've had, and trying to build up this idea of how how this would go. Because, um, and I've said this elsewhere in a in an interview or two, but just this, you know, what's what's the qualitative difference between them? You know, if Elendil had the ring at the very end and yeah. you had the choice to throw it into the fire would would he throw it in and uh, i think i told you this but you know yeah yeah Cor Corey olsen would immediately without thinking twice said he would definitely throw it in and uh and i and i'm not so sure because yeah. because you know in tolkien's writing we don't know whoever takes that ring it, it, it does something to you and, and is it something that's inherent in the personality and the character of the person that holds it that turns them even even the beautiful Frodo has to have his finger bitten off to let go of it in the yeah. end. I mean, so 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 what is the difference between because Elendil he's not in that position and perhaps he wouldn't do perhaps, but I think the sort of the the, the cheap way of doing it would be to say well he just had a horrible father and his mum died when he was younger and so that's why he turned bad or something yeah. sort of yeah. stupid and and I don't <laughs> think that's the case. I think what you have is a natural. Uh, you know the turbulence in that family caused by the grief of mother um, is is powerful, and and everyone reacts to to loss in a very different way and at different times. And I think that's what's happening for both of them, both father and son. He's not, you know, Elendil's not coping as well as he would like to, um, but also trying to marshal these and husband these kids 
through this through this stage and um so yeah i think i think it obviously it's going to be a key a key part of it maxim's quite musical so we were talking about the idea of a sort of baritone tenor duet that somehow that there are times that they will be together and singing the same tune and presumably times where they'll where they'll come apart um but you know what we do know again from these signposts that tolkien's given us is they will be fighting in the last alliance of elves and men Mm -hmm. uh, along with Gilgalad, etc. So, so presumably they're on the same team at that point. Um, I, I, I suspect there'll be um, there'll be discussions about the way the way to try and counter what's happening in Numenor. You know, because mm -hmm. again, there are going to be so many choices as to how you how you take on Falazon and, and everything that's happening, and what's the most effective way of doing that. Yeah. Um, along with Miriel, of course. Um, and my daughter, uh, Aarian. Yeah. Lot, lots, to, lots, lots of juice. To yeah, play there's with. a there's a lot of uh, um, potential family dynamics at play with the uh, the line of Elendil for sure. Yeah, yeah, and I think the writers have set them up brilliantly. You know, because that's always the question that we have when you when you when you're going to add additional material. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to what extent? You know, is it going to improve it rather than diminish it? And from my perspective, again. He's widowed. He's trying to bring up the family. He's he's slightly had to like he's an instinctive rejection of that celebration of death in the Elven ways that mm -hmm. brings the family. And then the schism that's in Numenor is potentially being reflected in the family as well. Because mm -hmm. and look, the argument, um, the argument for nationalism in Numenor stands up. You know, it mm -hmm. it doesn't when it gets to the to, to to as far as it ultimately goes. But right. Idea of wanting autonomy, of wanting to to, to shake off the shackles of um, what what can be considered is uh, is a restriction to progress. Yeah, you look at the the, the ban of the Valar that way. You know, if yeah. you you think, well, why can't we? What's, right. You know, and 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 as uh, you know, uh, this is what, again what we know from the writing. But as as Sauron in disguise says, it's it's they're lying to you. Yeah. And see why that might be a thing, you know, a conspiracy yeah. theory, something that we just want to get hold of and go, yeah, of course. Yeah. We can do this. And right. um, you know, well, that's and, like in uh the tale of Aragorn and Arwen, um, mm. is when you know Arwen it, it dawns on her, she understands why, and she has uh pity for the Numenorians because at Aragorn's death, she she finally gets why what happened in Numenor happened. Mm. And it's a beautiful, like some of the most beautiful Tolkien writings, I think, in, really in that passage. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Um, I'm, glad, I'm glad you feel that, so that, that side of the Numenorian argument, yeah. because I think it's, it's an important one to, to not just dismiss. Right. You know? yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now you did mention, since you mentioned the hypothetical question you had of, if Elendil takes the ring, if Isildur and Elendil are swapped, because you asked, I, I remember you asking me that at Comic Con as well. So I'm curious, you know, as you've been asking that to folks, are what are what are the responses that you've been getting from fans? Yeah, well, again, and, and you know, and, and I and I sort of uh, I've teased Corey Olson about this uh, this instinctive reaction, yeah, in that sense because because I just I thought it was revealing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm sure he can look. Most of you out there are greater experts than me, and and you know, and have lived with this in a deeper way than I have. So I just, I just, just posit the question, but I, I, I put it because, you know, trying to round out Elendil as a three-dimensional human being, and yeah. which is, which is my job as the actor, along with JD and Patrick, is, and so, that, so that question becomes something that I, that I feel I, I, I would like to find the answer, but, but I can't tell you that answer because. Yeah. Life hasn't happened to him as yet as much as it will. And I think, again, going back to that grief idea and loss, I think the, the effects of that, you can imagine, can't you, two different people with the same, the same losses, either, mm -hmm. you know, railing against the gods or trying to understand the reality of their life and accept what is. Yeah. And perhaps those are different reactions to that. And to that extent... Perhaps he would uh, immediately throw it in the fire. I don't know. I, I guess I'll tell you later on down the season line yeah. as to what, what I feel. But I, I, def I definitely think it's talking into to suggest we don't know until that moment. Yeah. Uh, and and we'd like to think all of us would be able to notice mm -hmm. the evil and the power in it. Right. But, 
I mean, that's some power, right? Yeah. That well, yeah. That was my my answer to you when you asked me. Was I want to say that Alinda would, but <laughs> I don't know that any mortal, you know, could at the at when push came to shove. Mm. Um, now we also got a hint of Elros. We got to see him on a tapestry in the episode and got his name dropped, talked about a little bit. So centuries and even millennia removed from Elros and the founding of Numenor, what does Elendil think of Elros? Very good question. Um, I mean, in that moment that he sees him on that tapestry and Galadriel mentions, of course, that she knows him, he kind of, it's such a distant, you know, he's an icon. Uh, it's such a distant part of his life and it's just, it, it brings it to reality for him about how old she is and how how much history she's seen. So um, again, I think, you know, I think growing up, um, again, one of the questions that I, that, that I suspect that that uh, Elvish was spoken less and less even in Elendil's lifetime, but there will there will be the faithful who will come back to. I don't think he would necessarily be bilingual um, at that age. Perhaps some people may be, um, you know, I have Welsh, North Wales and Welsh relatives who speak Welsh and that's definitely their first, first language. And then, and then English is second, but that's, a, that's very much living and, and, and not oppressed. It had been past, yeah. you know, a little bit culturally. Yeah. Um, so I think there's, there's an element of that um, uh, uh, here that um, it, it, it would be learnt, but it, but it might not be the first, you know, yeah. like the first language. Um, so a dangerous language at the time, at this current time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think so. I've just gone down a rabbit hole without. I've forgotten your original. <laughs> um, <laughs> I kind of did too. And I've got uh, you. Oh, well. what do, what does he think of Elros now? Oh yeah, yeah. So so to that extent, you know, you can imagine, uh, you know, Bible study classes where yes. where. They're about what happened and then and there he is up there as again for for elendil a hero archetype i mean what's fascinating about him is he makes that choice doesn't he he says mm. no i will i will take the gift of Iluvatar and i will choose mortality yeah which again would you choose that i don't know whether I right would. So it's a thing isn't it and there's something heroic in that as well isn't there yeah like deeply and i, and I suspect that would be part of the teaching when you're younger to say why did he make the decision what's What's good about that decision? Right. Because it, anyway, it kind of makes you wish that Tolkien fleshed out that story where we got, you know, a conversation between uh, Elrond and Elros and like yeah. got got a little bit deeper into that. But it's it's Absolutely. very intriguing, isn't it? Isn't it? So, yeah. So to that extent, definitely a, a, a hero for Elendil, for sure. But again, at the moment that we find him, it's slightly... Um, it's become a bit more complicated post post his wife's death um, yeah. as to his relationship to all of that. Now, I, I think the chat will hang me if I don't bring this up, but is there anything you can tell us about Narsil? Uh, Narsil is the sword that Aragorn uh, <laughs> reforges some thousand years later. Is that the right answer? That is that is a right answer, I suppose. Yeah, we, we can just leave it at that. I don't want to. I don't want to get you in trouble and have, uh, you know, you getting phone calls or anything. <laughs> exactly. Um, yes, I mean that's going to be a story, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, if it okay. isn't, we have to speak to JD and Patrick about. Yes, that, definitely. Right? Definitely. I suspect it will be a story, but you know, there's a limit. There's a limit to what I know. Most of it is in in those two gentlemen's heads. Yes. Um, so yeah, you can, you can, when you get them on, you can pin them down and ask. Them Excellent. I, I will definitely do that. I'll tell them Lloyd told me to, um, well, I can tell you about the sword that you've seen from the armory department in New Zealand was if, as they handed it to me. So they said, just to let you know, Lloyd, yours is the biggest sword we've made on the show. Mm. You have the biggest sword. And I was like, well, I mean, yeah. that's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I've as we're wrapping up here, I've got a few rapid fire questions that I like to ask folks who come on the show. Um, right. So just 
brief responses. You can elaborate if you want. There's no rules here, but um, just a, kind of a, a lightning round here. Okay. If you if you were to play any Tolkien character from any age who was not Elendil, who would you want to play? Well, out of family loyalty, I'd have to say Aragorn. Uh, mm. Sure, and yeah. I quite like to play that idea of you know he's such he's such a wonderfully enigmatic character when he first appears as Stride. You're like, who is this guy? Yeah, brilliantly written. Uh, but I'd also like to play it after all that history and all with all that insecurity in him that he thinks maybe I'm, maybe I will turn bad. Maybe I'm, I don't deserve, you know, so that's a really lovely, uh, a bit to play, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I'd, I'd have to stay loyal to him, but, um, but because Bilbo's in my heart, because I read ah. yeah, the Hobbit, I wouldn't, wouldn't mind having a go at him because I just loved, I loved him, you know, yeah. just, he was just, yeah beautiful to, to to fall in love with as a kid you know yeah that's a, that's my favorite hobbit character whenever i'm asked that question bilbo mm. is definitely number mm. one mm. um which rings of power character aside from elendil is your favorite in season one um and that's really difficult because that's a toss-up for me between i mean it's elrond really because of uh his his moral dilemma and, and what he's going through and how he is going to to progress with what's what's required of him by Gil Galad and yeah. Rimbrel. So that those that 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 um and being half elven, half human and, mm. and how that affects him. Yeah. Uh, um and not quite being part of that team, you know, so just feeling as an outsider and always having to prove himself a little bit. So that, that, yeah. but also, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm in, I'm in love with Kazakh Doom and the Dwarves and, oh, uh, yeah. and what both Sophia and uh, Owain are doing with those two. It's just fabulous. So yeah, quite like to have a go at that. Yeah. So um, you might've already answered this, but who is your favorite Tolkien character? Well, yeah, it'd be Bilbo for that. Bilbo. For that. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, uh, yes, definitely. Although, <sighs> I mean, though, when when you first meet Bilbo and he sees Gollum and that whole exchange, I mean, Gollum's mm. extraordinary. There's so many, aren't there? There's yeah. so many. Really, it's very hard to pinpoint the uh, uh, the one and only. I mean, Tom Bombadil, for heaven's sake! I mean, right. who want to get into that head and re right. re go? What? Please tell me what you've experienced. Yes. <laughs> please explain yourself. <laughs> who are you, really? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, which is your favorite Tolkien book? Yeah, that'll, that'll be Hobbit, but I mean, um, yeah. and then sec sections and pieces of all of this history of Middle Earth that, uh, that I've been diving into, but um, yeah, I'll stick with Excellent. Hobbit. Okay. Um, okay, last two but questions. I haven't reread re Hobbit for a long, long time. The most recent read was Lord of the, re -read was Lord of the Rings, which I loved, again, yeah. doubly since doing this, so it's become richer and richer. So I might, you know, maybe there won't be enough... Uh, Enough, enough sort of nourishment in Hobbit because it is for younger a younger mm -hmm. reader slightly you know anyway it's still fun it's very still yeah. a very fun read Andy Circus actually recorded an audiobook for it which is really oh. fun because you hear oh. all of the the Gollum dialogue that didn't make it into the film so which is really fun all right so I'll give him a royalty and purchase it there yeah. we go <laughs> cool. all right last two questions where in Middle Earth would you most want to live <sighs> I mean, obviously Numenor, because politically I can't say anything else because that's my that's my island. But uh, and I presume I'm not allowed to say the Undying Lands because that would be uh, quite a, quite. Uh, a, it's a little bit. bit of a cop out, but we could allow it. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think I think I think I mean Num Numenor is extraordinary. It's a paradise on earth. Who who wouldn't want to? Who wouldn't want to live there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing to recommend the Southlands at all. It seems to me. Yeah. Now, uh, where in Middle Earth would you most like to visit but not live? Um, well, again, as a Numenorian, I'd have to say Valinor because you you just want you'd, that thing that you're 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 told not to go towards. There is obviously a massive temptation, so right. I would like to get permission to visit in the full there knowledge. I'm gonna I'm gonna return and not mention it to anyone. I won't tell anyone what I saw. Um, so, permission yeah. is the key part of that I think it is <laughs> some people didn't ask permission for that one 
Well, Lloyd, thank you so much uh, for joining us today and taking time out of your day to uh, dive into Tolkien and uh, Elendil and um, you know the the lore behind the show and the show itself. Um, really appreciate you taking the time today. It's an absolute pleasure. You know, I look forward to more because as JD and Patrick take the lids off their brains and empty them onto the page, we can have loads to discuss, I feel. So um, yeah, it'd be great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks again, Lloyd. And thank you everyone for joining us today for this interview. Um, again, we'll have our watch party on Thursday night where we'll uh, presumably see more Elendil in episode four of The Rings of Power. Good and night. we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.